Good afternoon, everyone, and uh, welcome to our Women in Computing special presentation for the spring semester. Uh, I'd like to extend a very special welcome, of course, to all of our Women in Computing participants, both live and watching this on video. Uh, also faculty in the Computer Science Department uh, and other special invited guests. Uh, the Women in Computing Academic Success Program at, uh, in the Department of Computer Science uh, is partnered with the National Center for Women in Information Technology. And with that background and with the support of the university, we've been able to uh, provide female students in computing majors with opportunities for tutorial assistance, uh, success coaching, uh, resource sharing, uh, and the like. And I certainly want to give special thanks to Dr. Sarah McCaslin, who is our Women in Computing uh, leader and academic success coach for helping to organize this particular event. Well, uh, and, and by the way, Sarah will be serving as our uh, MC uh, as we move forward with our guest speaker. Well, our distinguished speaker for today is Morgan Carroll, a recent alumna of ours in computer science. From our participant, for all the participants that are tuning in or will see this on video, uh, Morgan was essentially in your shoes, so to speak, five years ago. Her academic work and extramural activities while a student at UT Tyler speaks volumes as how one like yourself can prepare for a successful professional career in computing. Uh, yours is an exceptionally wise choice to extend the prospects for a worthy professional career upon completion of your degree. Now, a little bit about Morgan. Uh, Morgan Carroll earned her bachelor's degree in computer science from the University of Texas at Tyler in 2017. While a student at UT Tyler, she participated in the local ACM chapter as the treasurer, as well as being selected for the Computing Research Association's Research Experience for Undergraduates, that's uh, abbreviated REU, for the summer session of 2015. Uh, Morgan, you can correct me later, but I believe that was in uh, uh, Alabama. Uh, or, or somewhere over in the uh, southeast area of the, uh, of the nation. But while participating in the REU program, she worked on a system called, uh, a project rather, called Pervasive Systems for Elder Care. And that project focused on using uh, uh, the technology required to assist er elderly citizens with automated home tasks. Upon graduating from UT Tyler, Morgan began work at IBM as a software developer on an internal tooling team. And after working in that role for about a year, she was promoted to the role of customer service manager, success manager rather. And as a CSM, she worked with IBM customers to build and deploy AI solutions on IBM cloud while providing architectural guidance. While working as a CSM, she concurrently earned her master's degree in computer science from Texas State University in 2020. Most recently, Morgan has moved into the senior cloud engineer role in IBM's technology garage, where she will continue to work with customers to build cloud native solutions on IBM cloud. Uh, apart from that, in her spare time, she enjoys spending times with her dogs, Apollo and Mr. Hubble, 3D printing, gaming, hiking, and astronomy, uh, as well as taking care of a, of a new home that uh, she uh, has now purchased. In addition, she enjoys mentoring other women in technology, as is the case today, and participating in her local Women of IBM chapter, residing currently in Austin, Texas. So let me pass the... Uh, uh, torch over to, if I may, uh, back over to uh, Dr. McCaslin. 
momentarily. There you go. All right. And uh, we're off and running with the with the real faces that are involved in today. So, Dr. McCaslin, floor is yours. All right. Thank you very much, Dr. Rainwater. All right, uh, Morgan, can you uh, tell us a little about yourself? All right. Well, thanks y'all for having me, and uh, thank you for the introduction, Dr. Rainwater. I mean, that pretty much covered it. Um, I. Yeah, I'll, I'll give a little bit more background. So um, I actually grew up in East Texas, not far from UT Tyler in a town called Slocum, which most people have never heard of. Um, and I actually did not even write any code until I was in college. So um, my high school, we didn't have any computer science courses or anything. It was very small. Um, we were actually undefeated in football, but only because we didn't have a football team. It was that small. <laughs> um, and so, um, yeah, so when I graduated, you know, I actually started at UT Tyler and I don't, I don't like to bring it up too much, but I dropped out my first semester and, um, I ended up just starting my own business, Morgan's computer services, where I did computer repair and tune-ups and stuff like that. Um, and then I earned my associate's degree at Trinity Valley Community College. And then once I finished there, I came back to UT Tyler um, where I earned my bachelor's in computer science, obviously in 2017. Um, and then I started at IBM, you know, again, as a software developer, and I've worked my way up to senior cloud engineer. Um, and while I was working, I earned my master's in computer science from Texas State University, which is super fun, super stressful, but totally worth it. Um, yeah, and I just, I love being here in Austin, Texas. So you were UT Tyler class of 2017 for yep. your uh, bachelor's in computer science. Can you tell us a bit about your transition from education to the workforce? Yes, um, it was challenging to say the least. Um, I remember I applied for, I kept this big spreadsheet. I had applied for over 300 different jobs, just looking like on Indeed and different employer websites, you know, stuff like that. Um, and I didn't get that many interviews, unfortunately. Um, I think I had a total of four or five different interviews out of the whole thing. So I was very discouraged, um, but you know, obviously it worked out. Um, so whenever I, you know, I had applied at IBM as one of those, I think I had applied for four or five different positions. Um, and they had me do a couple of coding tests online. So then I went through those and um, I took three and then I passed two of them um, and then ended up getting hired for one. So went from 300 plus down to, you know, the one position. <laughs> I love that you had a spreadsheet tracking that too. <laughs> I have spreadsheets for everything. I just upgraded my hot water heater, had a spreadsheet for that too. <laughs> <laughs> I love spreadsheets too. Okay, so I also noticed you participated in a, a Computing Research Association's REU during the summer of 2015. Can you tell us uh, about what you worked on with that? Yes, so uh, Dr. Rainwater, you were right. It was at the University of Alabama, roll tide. Um, so during the summer, um, the title of our project was called Pervasive Systems for Elder Care. And the goal of it was to create a voice activated um, Windows phone app with a, a very simple phone. And the purpose was so that we could provide elderly citizens with some sort of app that they could use to control devices in their home. Um, the idea is that, you know, if you're an elderly person, you're going to get, you're going to have a better quality of life the longer you can stay in your home versus having to move into some sort of like long term care facility. Um, so, so that's what we did that summer. Um, we wrote the app in C Sharp, which was super fun to learn. Um, and the whole thing sounds very complicated, but actually at the end of the summer, all we had managed to do was turn on a light bulb. <laughs> that's all our app did. But that's kind of the purpose of the, the research experiences is that you're gonna take college students who don't have a lot of experience in whatever specific area this is. And they're gonna go and, you know, we, we actually lived there on the campus for six weeks that summer. Um, and it was like, kind of like having a full-time job, you know, every day you go into the lab and you're working on stuff. And then 
we also had some fun activities that we got to do. Um, there was another REU that was going on that summer and they were, they were doing some kind of water sample study thing. So we got to go wading through a creek with them, collecting water samples. Um, so that was pretty fun. Um, but yeah, overall, that's, that's basically what we did that summer is we turned on a light bulb. Hey, I, I can imagine that was challenging doing that with code. <laughs> so. Okay, so um, what would you say was your greatest takeaway from that research experience? Oh, um, definitely learning C sharp um, because that kind of set off a chain of events. So, you know, I hadn't outside of what I had learned in school, I hadn't really worked on any projects or done any coding or anything like that. Um, but while I was there, you know, I learned C sharp for the app. And then I believe it was a year, a year and a half, maybe, I think it was about a year later, um, there was a NASA facility in Palestine called Columbia Scientific Balloon Facility. And they were looking for an intern who knew C sharp. And so I was like, oh, wow, like I know C sharp. I didn't really think I was gonna get it because, you know, I just had like six weeks of experience, but I did sure enough, you know, I got, I got hired for the internship. So just, you know, learning C sharp in that six week period led me to having a NASA internship, which is pretty cool. Yeah, that is pretty cool. So I understand you're now a senior cloud engineer at IBM. Um, that sounds quite impressive. Can you share with us a little bit more about your experience in getting hired by IBM? Yeah, definitely. Um, so like I mentioned earlier, you know, there was like the coding test that we, we have to do online to get hired. Um, so if you pass the coding test, basically, if your code compiles and gives the right answer, then that means you've passed the assessment. Um, and then you go through a couple of interview experiences. Um, and in my case, they were virtual. This was way before COVID, but it's just, you know, with distance and everything. Um, and since I was living in Tyler at the time, it was all virtual. And um, after that, I, IBM actually has this really cool thing that you do before you get hired. It's called the finish line event. And so they, they fly out all of the candidates to some IBM location. Um, in my case, I think it was in Atlanta. Yeah, it was in Atlanta. And you work on a project with another group of potential new hires and you're there for like three days, I think it was. Um, and you're doing like fun activities and you're hearing people talk about what it's like to work at IBM, um, stuff like that. So you go through this whole experience, you know, and then if they, you know, if you, if you do well and, you know, they see that you're working well with other people, then you get a job offer. Um, and I actually remember I was in the drive through at Chick-fil-A when I got the text message offer from Watson, which is pretty cool. I was like, oh, look, there it is. I was waiting on my chicken nuggets. Um, <laughs> so, yeah, so I started as a software developer, an entry level software developer. Um, and then we had some kind of change ups in the company and organization specifically. And so my manager asked if I wanted to become a, a customer success manager, which back then was referred to as a cloud adoption leader. Um, and back then I was like, no, I don't want to do this. I just want to write code all day. I don't want to talk to anybody. Um, but she convinced me. She was like, no, I think you'd be good at this. Just give it a try. If you don't like it, we'll find something else for you. So I was like, okay. Um, so obviously I liked it because I ended up doing it for about three years. Um, so uh, what customer success managers do is we work with customers to sort of guide them along their AI journey. And in my case, we focused on AI, I've got chatbots coming out of my ears, essentially. Um, and so we help them make architectural decisions and help them actually get hands on and build POCs. Um, and we also do, you know, some knowledge transfer, like here's how you build a chatbot, here's how you do this, you know, here's how you deploy a cloud native application to IBM cloud, stuff like that. So, um, but now I'm actually in the process of transitioning from my customer success manager role to a senior cloud engineer. Um, so being a senior cloud engineer, I'm going to be doing a lot of similar stuff, except um, I think the main difference is I'm going to be more focused on just creating proof of concepts with customers and I won't be, you know, have a specific set of customers assigned. So for the past three years, um, I would always have like a specific, either one customer at a time or multiple groups that I was responsible for. Um, so I think that's going to be the main difference, but being a senior cloud engineer, um, I'm going to be able to do just the coding stuff and then also provide some mentorship to new hires and again, knowledge transfer, you know, teach them what I know about cloud native development um, and all that good stuff. Okay, that sounds very interesting. 
So um, is there anything else you can tell us about the kind of work you do at IBM? Like, you know, a typical day or something like that, whatever you feel comfortable talking about. Yeah, so that's that's the thing about, you know, being a CSM for the past three years has been every day is kind of different. You never know what's going to pop up. Um, but I would say probably, you know, there's lots of lots of WebEx calls, you know, because uh, we're in the middle of COVID. So everyone is like, okay, I just want to talk to somebody. Let's get on a call. Like everybody's like, what time should we have a meeting? Well, let's get on a call and talk about what time we should have the meeting. <laughs> but um, I spent a lot of time teaching my customers how to do stuff essentially. You know, so if someone comes to me and says like, hey, I have a chat bot um, and I need to be able to connect it to a backend database, you know, something along those lines, then a lot of my job is I'm gonna go and actually put something together for them. And either, whether it's code or like a how-to or like a video or a blog or whatever, you know, lots of knowledge transfer. Um, yeah, so I'd say that's that's a general day in the life. You know, I'll be presented with some kind of a problem that the customer has, and then I just have to take that and figure out how am I going to make them successful. Okay, that sounds that sounds kind of challenging. <laughs> it does. <laughs> so, what do you feel has contributed the most to your success at IBM? Oh, um, yes, this is an easy one. So um, definitely my coworkers and my managers that I've had, um, the people that I work with are just phenomenal. And um, they, everyone, you know, especially my team from this last year, everyone works together so well and everyone wants to build, we wanna build each other up. You know, there's, there's not any like competition or, you know, like, oh, I have to keep this thing that I'm doing a secret because I don't want somebody else to take credit for it. You know, it's, it's not like that. We all work together really, really well and we support and celebrate each other. Um, like when I broke the news, you know, that I was gonna be leaving my role as a CSM to go on to the senior cloud engineer role. My team was really happy for me. You know, they were sad that I was leaving and, you know, they kind of picked at me, we we're like a family, but, um, but overall, it was really positive. So I, I definitely think that without the support and encouragement of my coworkers and managers, then I wouldn't be where I am. Cool. Cool. So you're transitioning into senior cloud engineer. What does it mean to be a senior cloud engineer? So in general, a cloud engineer is someone who is building stuff to be deployed into the cloud, you know, as they say, the cloud is essentially someone else's computer. So in our case, you know, IBM cloud is we have all of our different data centers, we're running different services. Um, so my area of specialty for the past years has been chatbots. So if someone wants to create a chatbot, you know, we can go into IBM cloud and do everything from the cloud. I don't have to go spin up a server, you know, my closet or something and then host my chatbot there. It's just, it's all in IBM cloud and the way you spin it up is, super easy. You don't have to worry about the underlying infrastructure or anything. You just click a few buttons and then you're ready to build your chatbot. Um, so being a cloud engineer is basically building stuff that is going to work on IBM cloud using best practices. Um, and so being a senior cloud engineer just kind of means that you have a little bit more experience doing that kind of stuff and you're going to be able to, to teach the sort of the cloud engineers who have less experience how to do these things, as well as actually building more complex stuff for customers. Okay. So what is the most interesting project you've worked on since graduating? Ooh, um, oh, definitely the COVID chatbots that we did last year. So um, IBM had, you know, whenever the pandemic started, and, and I promise I'm not, IBM's not telling me to say these things, but I do love working for IBM. They're such a great company. Um, whenever the pandemic started, you know, we had a group of IBMers in the Watson assistant team that were like, hey, we're going to build a COVID chatbot that we can just provide to customers to use for free and we're going to help them build it. So, you know, if you have like a doctor's office or a restaurant or something, they, they need to get the information out to their customers like, are you open right now? Are you doing, you know, maybe to go orders or whatever kind of relevant information there is. Um, we actually had a lot of government organizations like different cities, municipalities, stuff like that, um, use these. And um, 
so the SWATs and assistant team, they, they built this chatbot, you know, they kind of made a generic version of it. And then they worked with customers to customize it for them. And then once they were done with, you know, their initial period of like, okay, we're going to get this deployed. Then the customer success team came in and helped the customer maintain it. So a lot of times customers are like, okay, we want to take this to the next level. We need to add this extra stuff to it or, you know, whatever else it was. Um, so we basically walked them through the process. Like, here's how you do it. We did lots of, you know, like we're going to have a session where we teach the customers, like, here's how to make changes on your own, because we want them to be able to, you know, we don't want them to have to depend on us. I mean, we'll, we would be here for them if they need us, but we also just want to make sure that they're, they're familiar, familiar with the service and know how to, you know, if they just need to go say like, all right, we need to update our store hours in the chat bot. They could easily go in and do that. Um, but I would definitely say that's probably the most interesting project I've worked on. It wasn't, I don't think it was technically challenging um, to a certain degree, but it was just, it was nice, you know, to be able to, to help out people during COVID. Yeah, yeah, that sounds really cool. So uh, you also hold a master's degree in computer science from Texas State University, correct? Yes. All right, what was the primary focus of your studies there? So this is the interesting thing because I've gotten asked this before, but I actually did not have an area of focus for a thesis. So I did um, at Texas State, they have a few different options that you can do. Um, you could do a master's like with a minor if you choose, or um, you could choose the thesis option. But I actually did the kind of the regular sort of generic, just computer science non-thesis option. So um, since there was no thesis, I actually just had to do a comprehensive exam at the end of the degree, which was very difficult um, <laughs> to say the least, but it's, they give you, you know, like four different groups of questions and they're like, all right, so you've taken at least one class from this group. So you get to pick the question and answer that. Um, but it's, it's pretty complex. Like we had to memorize a lot of algorithms for this test. <laughs> oh yeah. <laughs> Yeah, that sounds that sounds harder than being specialized maybe <laughs> I, that's what i thought i was like i should have did i should have done the thesis option but um i was actually working you know full time for ibm at the time and ibm sponsored me to do the master's program which was fantastic um and so half of my master's program was before covid so i was actually traveling maybe like every every other week every three weeks or so to go work with customers like be on site doing workshops or quarterly business reviews or whatever. Um, so that was pretty challenging trying to, because I was taking two classes per semester. Um, so I was doing a lot of studying on airplanes. There were there were weeks like where I would get off an airplane and I have, I'd have to drive straight to college. And then, you know, I'd, the class would be like at 6.30 at night till like nine something. And then, you know, after that, then I get to go home and then maybe there, there was one specific week where I'd like flown back, went to class. And then the very next morning, I had to fly back out to go see another customer. So yeah. it was fun. <laughs> that sounds intense. Really yeah. <laughs> well, what advice do you have for students as they enter the job market? Um, I would say definitely don't get discouraged because, you know, with COVID and everything going on right now, it's it's harder to find positions, but um like I mentioned at the beginning, I applied for over 300 different positions and ended up getting like four or five interviews or something like that. So, but what I did was I applied for positions that I wasn't sure if I was qualified for. I mean, obviously, you know, as a fresh out of college with no experience, I'm not going to apply for something that specifically requires 10 years of experience. Mm -hmm. But if it's something that I think I could do and learn pretty quickly, then, um, then I just applied for it and you know ended up getting one so <laughs> that's cool that's cool I apologize for the feline interruption back here <laughs> I saw I've got one of my dogs right here I made oh, sure yeah. she's in the background <laughs> <laughs> okay so um uh if you knew as a student what you know now what would you have done differently Ooh, that's a good one so many things i would have probably exercised more and ate way less taco bell um <laughs> actually i probably i would have some kind of 
maybe like a side project or something not school related to work on. Um, which, you know, in my job now, I know there's sort of a specific culture around being a software developer and like, okay, you've always got to have like coding projects going on and stuff like that. Well, I mean, if I'm coding all day at work, I don't necessarily want to come home and write code. Sometimes I may, maybe I do, maybe a little bit, but, um, but for students, I think in college, it's really important to have some kind of like a connection to something outside of their academic experience when it comes to writing code or, you know, any kind of technical work, really. Um, so I would recommend, you know, just some kind of side project, something that you're interested in. Um, and especially because if you if you're going to apply for jobs, you know, you can say like, hey, this is another type of thing that I am interested in and I know how to do and I'm good at it. It may not be directly related to the job, but it's going to show that you have, you know, the skills to to learn a, you know, that's, that's the most important thing, but also, you know, for instance, I really like 3d printing. Um, if I, you know, if I talk about that at work, they're like, Oh, well, that's, you know, that's cool. Maybe that means you're kind of creative. I don't think I am, but you know, it's, so it's stuff like that. It's important to have like the extracurricular activities, but something that sort of is parallel to what you're learning in school, but it's going to give you some sort of real life experience. Okay. That sounds, the 3d printing sounds really interesting. <laughs> It's fun. <laughs> so what was the most important thing you learned at UT Tyler? Well, obviously everything I learned in Dr. Rainwater's classes, I remembered <laughs> every single thing. <laughs> um, I would say, I wanna say it was really anything around logic that I learned. Um, you know, it's funny that I had a math minor while I was there and people always talk about you don't use calculus in real life and okay you know in some cases that's that's fair I really don't use calculus at work but it's just knowing how to think in that way using logic on a very basic level um, I remember there was one class that I took and you know we had to go through like logic gates and stuff like that that kind of it, it seems simple but that kind of stuff is really important whenever you're you're trying to do some kind of problem solving especially like debugging code for instance you know that kind of stuff helps you. So I think it not necessarily any specific like one topic, it was just the way that you're taught to think whenever you're taking these computer science classes. That's probably the best, the best experience. Okay. Okay. So what advice do you have for computer science and information technology students as they, uh, well, I think I've already asked this, as they prepare to enter the marketplace, is there any other advice that you have with that regard? Yes, I would say um, definitely keep in mind that imposter syndrome is a thing and we all feel like, I mean, I'll be honest, like every day, I just, if I do something, I'm like, I'm an idiot. How, how am I here? Like, why doesn't that be on fire me now? Because what did I just do, you know? Um, but everybody feels that way. None, none of us really think like, oh, like I am fully qualified to be doing exactly what I'm doing right now, but it's not about that. And it honestly, as long as you have a positive attitude and you're willing to learn, I think that's the most important thing. You know, anyone can do anything. You just have to be able to learn it and be willing to put in the work. And as long as you have that mindset, you can do anything. And I'm really uh, glad that you mentioned imposter syndrome because that's something um, I struggle with that to this day. So I'm glad you mentioned that. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Um, uh, does anyone have any questions for Morgan? Yes, actually I do. Um, first and foremost, I'd like to introduce myself, Morgan. As Dr. Rainwater said, I'm Aya. I am a current senior at UT Tyler, and my major is Computer Information Systems. Um, I'm a bit jealous that you got to have Dr. Rainwater as professor. He's only my, <laughs> my chair of the department, but lucky you. <laughs> Very lucky, yes. <laughs> yes, so um, Dr. McCaslin kind of touched on this, and thank you for asking the question. Um, I'm about to enter the workforce. Uh, I thankfully found a job as a, a consultant for data engineering and analytics. And I would like to ask, when you first started out as a woman, 
with let's say you don't know real world experience not world excuse me work experience as one would say what kind of advice would you give someone who's you know about to enter the workforce fresh out of college that sort of thing how can I transition from school mindset to work mindset yeah, that's a really good question um, because I did struggle a little bit going from, you know, when you're in college or school of any kind, really, you're, it, it feels like it's a 24 seven job. Like you, you never, it's never not on your mind. You know, there's always an assignment or a project that's due and it's like, you do have to work on this stuff in the evenings and weekends, you know, in your free time or whatever. Um, the nice thing about, you know, work is that most of the time, unless there's some kind of catastrophic issue going on most of the time, you know, it's like during the day you're at work and then when it's over, you know, you can just go on about your day. So it's important to keep that in mind because I think when I started, I always wanted to just do more and more and more. Like I wanted to overexert myself, but that's, it's just, it's not a good thing. You know, you have to make sure you take time for yourself and, you know, find activities that you like doing. Like I, you know, take my dogs for walks and spoil them beyond belief, really. That's one of my hobbies, <laughs> you know, the 3D printing or whatever. I find other kind of fun stuff to do. Um, so that's one thing. But then also my first year, I'd say maybe like my first six months at IBM, I came to work every day just terrified because <laughs> it's the imposter syndrome. Again, I was like, I don't know how to do any of this. What am I doing here? This is, I'm doing this wrong, you know, but luckily I had a lot of, a lot of time for on the job training. Um, but it's just keep in mind that, you know, for the first maybe year or so, I mean, it'll be different for everyone. It's, it's probably going to be a little bit challenging because there's so much to learn because you're kind of, you know, starting here at the bottom, you know, you've got your degree and you're like, all right, I'm about to begin my whole career. So you just have to keep that perspective in mind that don't compare yourself to somebody who, you know, like me, who has four or five years of experience already, you have to compare yourself to where were you a year ago and where are you now? And then just be proud of that and don't don't get overwhelmed. Thank you for answering the question. Yes, actually, that's something I'm actually kind of internally struggling with right now um, because I'm 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 very afraid. It's like okay, it's go time in August, and you know, yeah. usually around August I, we start school. So it's like I said, we're transitioning from that school life to work life thing. So thank you for that. Um, I also want to mention thank you for being open and honest about your struggle during your first year during school. Um, I struggled immensely. And honestly, I was about to drop out had it not been for a couple of my professors. One of them is Kate Pleasant. Uh, wonderful. Uh, yeah. <laughs> yeah, you probably know her. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, she yeah. Who encouraged me to stay, even though I had a very, very, very low GPA. And she's like, listen, it's not the end of the world. Put yourself back together and just climb up. You can only go up from here. And so um, I think because of her today, I'm here. So Thank you for being open and honest about that. I think a lot of people don't share their struggles and they're like, oh, well, you know, look at Morgan or look at Aya. They're, they're fine now. They went to college and have a job. They didn't struggle at all. So I think it's really- Yeah, that's definitely, I 100% agree. And that's why I like sharing these experiences. You know, it's sort of painful to talk about like, oh, I dropped out of college. And, you know, between us and this recording and whoever else watches it, I actually dropped out more than once. But, you know, I think persistence is key. I kept coming back. I was determined. I was, I was like, you know what? I'm not going to let these life situations get in my way. I'm, I'm going to finish. So I, and I also too, at one point had an extremely low GPA and I've been on, you know, probation and suspension and all that kind of stuff, um, academic probation and suspension and all that. Um, but that's really good advice. And I love Miss Pleasant. I had her for a couple of classes. Um, yeah, you, she's you, yeah. And you, there's nowhere to go, but up and, you know, it's, one day you're going to look back on the struggles. You're going to be like, wow, I'm so proud of myself because that was really, really hard. And now I've managed to work my way here, you know? Yes. And thank you so much for sharing about that. Um, I have one more question. If Dr. McCaskill, mm -hmm. you know, kick me out before this. <laughs> no, go ahead. Thank you. So um, Morgan, I'd like to know what is one, or maybe you have more than one thing, but what is one thing you kind of knew before you entered the workforce? You know, something that was... I don't know, maybe obvious to you, but not so, not so obvious in the sense that, you know, I kind of knew this, but I didn't know what would happen in the work life sort of thing. I hope my question makes sense. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I think so. Um, so I think probably in my case, it would be, you know, like, what do I do if I don't know how to do something at work? 
And I, you know, I was terrified. I was like, I don't want to admit that I don't know this. It's simple. Like, but like, you know, like I mentioned before, I've always had amazing team members. So I was able to just go and ask one of my team members, like, Hey, um, I don't actually know how to do like a console.log statement in JavaScript, you know, which is super simple, but I didn't know JavaScript before I started working. Um, and they were like, oh yeah, well, let me show you. It's no big deal. You know, but beforehand I, I knew it was going to be hard to ask for help. Um, but what I didn't know was like the response that I would get from asking for help. I mean, it's way better to ask for help and kind of make yourself a little vulnerable. Like, Hey, I don't know this thing versus, you know, if you spend four or five hours trying to struggle through it on your own, well, you're just wasting time at that point. Um, so yeah, I've always, I've been very lucky. I've always had very helpful coworkers. Thank you for answering that. Yeah. Morgan, I had a, a question regarding your master's degree. Uh, mm -hmm. I think what it is you were describing is what we have here as a, what's called a professional option versus a thesis option. Now, you don't write a, a, an official publishable thesis, albeit you may have had to write some papers along the way as a part of other courses here. Uh, what kinds of or, or groups of kinds of courses did you take when you were uh, doing this? Yeah, so, um, you know, we had the kind of core group of classes that everyone has to take their stuff over databases, um, algorithms. I'm trying to think of the third group, there were actually quite a few classes you could choose from. So the third group, I did um, an advanced artificial intelligence class, which was really fun. I don't know if anyone's familiar with the Wumpus game, but um, it's basically a grid and, you know, you've got the little Wumpus monster. He's like in a pit or something. And so you have to use uh, logic and basically proofs to determine, okay, how do I navigate away from this grid and or through this grid and find where the Wumpus is? You know, it sounds simple from a human perspective as I could just look at the grid and see, but you have to think of it as like, how would a computer essentially, you know, navigate this and they can only see one, you know, one block around them or whatever. Um, so that class was definitely the hardest one that I took, but probably the most fun. And we did have to do a few different projects and a few different papers for that one. It felt like a thesis all on its own, really. <laughs> so uh, any uh, aspirations to uh, go beyond that uh, for a PhD or something? Oh, I've thought about it. Um, I don't think so, but you know, we'll see if uh, if I get bored next year. Probably. <laughs> I, under, I understand that completely. I, I I'm thinking that the the what you have accomplished, uh, you're describing of your your academic experience coming through TVCC. Uh, that was in the was that the Palestine Anderson County yep. campus, yeah. Uh, yeah. And you know, having to drop out some, have to be encouraged and all that, but to but to, to, to reach these milestones, including the master's degree, does say something strong about your potential beyond that. And I, I can say that to you. I can say it uh, to any of our students who, who uh, can get and move into that, that, that particular direction. So it's something to think about. And certainly, if, if you do something like that, you're going to stay in touch with us and let us know what you're doing. Yeah, absolutely. And a, a word of advice to anyone watching this, if I could do it, you could definitely do it. <laughs> Morgan was a very hard working student. Uh, I'm trying to think of data structures and we had an algorithms class too. Were you in both of those or at least one of yes, those for mine? Yes, and operating systems, I think I took. Ah, and operating systems. That's right, too. I like that class. Yeah. Uh, not, that she's, <laughs> not that she's written any operating systems since then, but, no. you know, the, the, the real crux of computing is how, do, how does it all work? You're describing the logic gates as an example. Uh, you're describing AI, how, you know, what's, what, is, what underlies all that and makes it work? And that's, what, that's really what our field is all about. Yeah, exactly. I, I strongly believe pretty much anybody can learn how to write code. You know, that's just, you're writing code, but actually being able to understand the logic underneath, like at a very foundational level, that's the hard part. Mm -hmm. All right. Well, um, are there any other questions that have popped up in anyone's mind? I, 
actually have one more for Miss Morgan. Um, oh, and this is somewhat touching and based off of what Dr. Rainwater has said. Um, I am thinking of getting a master's, but uh, not anytime soon after, you know, this time. <laughs> the senioritis is very <laughs> But I do know that my work does compensate me if I do get a master's degree. So I'm just wondering, do you have any advice for someone who's thinking to get one, but I'm unsure of maybe what to, you know, get or maybe an MBA or something computer science related? Yeah, I think uh, spending a little bit of time in the workforce will help you determine like what it is that you're really interested in and what you want to pursue, you know, whether it's an MBA or if it's something like computer science, you know, whatever. Once you have that work experience and you, you know, kind of touched on a few different topics, it becomes a little bit easier to pick. Um, and if you do decide to do it, like while you're working, I would definitely say that time management is very important. I had very little free time while I was working on this degree. So, um, but I did have to make sure, you know, like, okay, Tuesday nights, I'm going to study this Wednesday nights, you know, study this, but Saturdays or usually for me, Sundays, that's my rest day. I'm not doing anything. Um, so it's also just really important to take the rest time. And it's really just a, a very small little snippet of your life in, in, in academics, whether it be undergraduate or for that matter, uh, at a graduate level, uh, meaning that uh, all of you young ones have so many, many, many years down the road to which, you know, once again, you can, you can flourish in your professional career, uh, but also have a lot of time uh, and perhaps increased earnings as well to enjoy some of the finer things in life. Uh, so certainly, certainly a good, good direction to go in. Yep, I agree. All righty. Well, thank you both for your input. I really appreciate it. Of course. Hey, well, <clears throat> there's no more questions. Uh, well, uh, Morgan, we really do appreciate you uh, uh, allowing yourself to be interviewed and allowing us to ask questions. I think this will be very beneficial for our students. And um, I just and I appreciate your openness and your honesty about your um, academic experiences and imposter syndrome. I thank you so much. And um, I guess as far as recording, that should be it. So I'll go ahead and- I would uh, say, just in concluding also, thank you, Morgan, for, for contributing to, uh, to this session, but also to our program. Uh, uh, you make a, uh, uh, a perfect role model for these students and, and Aya, or I don't know if you're from East Texas, from but these rural folks, like myself as another example, you know, uh, <laughs> not ever thinking that, you know, when I was so much younger, how I was able to master and 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 thrive, I guess, in a professional way, uh, uh, by taking some of the steps that you've actually mentioned. So we're we're of great appreciation for your being here and sharing with us, and uh, uh, certainly we uh, hope to hear from you soon about your future successes. Uh, so. I suppose at this time, I'll allow uh, Sarah to give whatever closing final comments she may have, and she can then hit the stop the record button, and we'll be finished officially for the day. Uh, thank you, Aya, for, for being here with us, uh, Lori, and uh, again, I hope that all of the uh, those who uh, can uh, view this uh, video uh, will also find some encouraging ideas there. Uh, moving forward uh, for what could and should be a very worthy career ahead. I definitely agree with Dr. Rainwater on that. So again, thank you, Morgan, for uh, uh, participating. And yeah, thank y'all for having me. Yeah, and for letting us pick your brain, so to speak. <laughs> and, <laughs> Absolutely. Uh, uh, Aya, thank you for participating. You asked some very good questions. And uh, Dr. Rainwater, uh, we appreciate this opportunity to get this kind of information out to our female students involved in the uh, computer science and computer information uh, classes. And with that, I will go ahead and uh, stop our recording. And let me see.